Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the narrative lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Christopher Van Kaufman. And today we're talking about Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 29. And this is this happens sometimes in the narrative lectionary where we'll get a longer section of text where there are different places you can place your emphasis. And that's something as you prepare, you'll want to think about. And we get in the first part, uh, Mark 1, 6, 1 through 6, Uh, this encounter that Jesus has in his hometown and the way in which people are confused in that Jesus, as we know, Mark begins with Jesus in the middle of things. There are not all of these signs and wonders that precede him. And so the people from his hometown are confused as to how Jesus is, uh, has suddenly changed. Then after that, we get the so-called sending of the 12, where Jesus sends out his disciples in order to proclaim the kingdom of God, and he gives them certain directions about how they are to conduct themselves when they are on this missionary journey. And then finally, the longest section of this text is the death of John the Baptist, which is uh, from 17 on onward. And this is a little bit of a flashback. This is something that has actually happened earlier chronologically, uh, but Mark presents it right here. And I think we'll spend quite a bit of our time today talking about that. Uh, It's a very interesting story with quite a bit of resonance with the Old Testament, which we're going to talk about. And one of the ways that I often introduce the story in class is that this is the world's worst birthday party. (laughs) Yeah, uh, so let's, uh, let's dive into that and then if we have time we can come back to Jesus at Nazareth uh, mm-hmm. and the sending out of the 12 so uh say uh i'm going to ask you Christopher uh, say a bit about the old testament resonances that you see here yeah so one of the things that we see especially in the book of Daniel but it occurs elsewhere is what we call a court tale which is where we have a story that takes place within a royal court where the actions of a king end up demonstrating the power of God. And in this way, we see that Mark plays with that. And he it ends where, if you're aware of that backstory, so for example, Daniel in the lion's den, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace, mm-hmm. uh, the writing on the wall, there are these stories of especially kings making rash promises, kings blustering, kings doing all these things and uh, being re- being shown to be ridiculous. You can put the book of Esther in there yep, as well. Exactly. Joseph, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and Joseph. Joseph. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is a very uh, recurrent theme. And so for hearers of Mark and readers who are familiar with those themes, there's a certain expectation set up. And Mark is going to play with that expectation and I think set up He's trying to tell you something about Jesus with the way in which things end up for John the Baptist. So I think it's it's helpful to remind your uh, congregations about these other stories and the way in which they end, which God's intervention to save the person who is uh, suffering because of the king's bluster, and the way in which uh, John this story of Herod and John the Baptist ends in a very different way. Well, keep going with that. I mean the. uh... One presumes the audience already knows this. The audience Mm -hmm. that's hearing the story, uh, you know, if we imagine a date for the Gospel of uh, Mark is, you know, sometime after 70. Mm -hmm. So they know this. They know John's dead. Mm -hmm. And so, but the characters in the story don't. Yep. And um, what uh, what you've just heard uh, is um, that Jesus has sent out the twelve. And they're casting out demons and doing things. And King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. And so, uh, and one of them says, it is Elijah, uh, or, uh, but Herod, you know, who who is this guy? Well, it's Elijah, because Elijah's the eschatological figure. He's going to come back. It's a prophet, like one of the prophets, because there's a, there will be a prophet coming, another eschatological figure. And, oh, but Herod, no, it's John whom I beheaded. No, I have two. I have, first of all, do your thing about how 
uh, the narrator here plays with this to tell us something about Jesus. And then I have a different question I want to ask. Yeah, so the first thing is that the narrator is helping us to see the difference between Jesus and John. That's one of the things that he points out at the very beginning of the gospel. And Mark 1 starts with John the Baptist and Jesus going out to be baptized by him. But he also wants to make the point that something different is going on with Jesus. And part of the art of the story, again, is the ridiculousness of Herod. And so by putting these words in Herod's mouth that Herod thinks Jesus is just John all over again, he shows, Mark wants to show that people who think of Jesus as just another prophet, as just another John the Baptist, are themselves ridiculous like Herod. They're wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. And then Herod does a ridiculous thing, which is he offers up to half his kingdom. And then... uh, yeah, this is this is one of those uh, tropes from mm-hmm. these court tales. Is mm-hmm. the king makes a bold claim that out of fear of shame and embarrassment, or according to Daniel, out of the law of the Persians and the Medes, which cannot be revoked, mm-hmm. they have to follow through on, and they instantly regret having done this. And here, the as you said, it's that half his kingdom and anything he'll give up because he's so. Uh, he thinks that the dance that his, I guess we'd call her stepdaughter, has done is so great. Uh, but again, instantly regrets having made this blusterous oath. Well, and it's exactly what, uh, again, in the book of Esther, the mm-hmm. king Ahasuerus promises, right, a few times to Esther, uh, I'll give you anything up to half the kingdom. Well, that ends happily, right, because Esther is a Jew and uh, and and is acting to save her people uh and so uh you know those who hear this story think that that's what's going to happen but um our hero ends up with his head on a platter instead mm. so so what does this tell us about about Jesus then uh, that that he's uh, he's certainly he's not John the Baptist kind of resurrected or or um you know um reincarnated. Uh, He's not Elijah. He's not a a prophet, uh, that he's something more than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think where it ends is very interesting as well as kind of Mark is foreshadowing or pointing us towards the end of his gospel. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Mm. We're going to return in 10 chapters to the laying of a body in a tomb. And again, what it does is it sets up this difference between the two of them. John the Baptist, well, there's a similarity and then there's also a difference. The similarity is that Jesus, like John the Baptist, is not going to be miraculously rescued. Mm. When we get to Mark 15, what happens is that Jesus, like John the Baptist, is executed by the authorities. But then again, we also get that difference because this is the end of the story of John the Baptist and Mark. That is the last thing we hear is that he is laid in a tomb. And then, not to spoil it, but when we get to Mark 16, (laughs) uh, we see that the tomb is not the end of Jesus' story. Mm. That's helpful. Uh, It's already actually answered the question I was going to ask, which is why why would Herod say, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised? I mean, that's a level of paranoia, Mm -hmm. but it turns out then foreshadowing is not exactly paranoia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, very much so. Well, I think that will obviously um, preach. Let's touch on the first two stories, the rejection of Jesus at Nazareth, um, which is interesting for a couple reasons. One is it immediately follows the stories of... uh, the 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 faith has saved you. Your trust mm-hmm. in Jesus has saved you mm-hmm. in the previous stories that we had last week. And now you have even people who know Jesus don't know um, who he is necessarily. Uh, right, his own hometown. I mean, uh, s- somebody once said, "I heard I heard somebody at a church uh, to help my uh, committee think through something once," and the his boss said, I guess an expert, he was disparaging the, 
the person I hired, and he said, well, I guess an expert is anybody who comes from more than 15 miles away. <laughs> and sort of this is the opposite. Anybody who knows you, uh, you know, you're still always in the family or village system. You're still, you know, little Rolf. You'll never, ever be, you know. Uh, mm. There's that human thing. But this has troubled people, and some people make a big deal out of it. He could do no deed of power there except... Uh, well, he did heal a few sick people. Yeah. But that their their lack of faith prevented him, his power from being effective in their lives. Yeah. Because, again, faith is how one receives promise and grace and forgiveness and such matters. Yeah. And I think there's some very interesting, uh, you know, when you talk about we often read these um, these narratives because we do them once a week. We often read them out of connection with uh, those that have come before. There's a really interesting continuation of the theme of touching and hands in Mark 6. I hadn't noticed this before, but they make this point about Jesus. What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Yeah, that's nice. And then immediately talk about his profession. He's a carpenter. He's somebody who works with his hands. How can those hands that are workmen's hands do deeds of power? And then he lays hands on people at the end. Well, although we've already seen that Jesus' power of touch is so important, but they miss it because they're so fixated upon his profession. All right. Question for you again, because I do always ask about Greek. No. Nope. Um, the word doesn't actually mean carpenter. It does not. Tectone, mm -hmm. as in like technician. Yep. It's a an guy it who works a skilled laborer. Yeah, it means a craftsman of some kind. It's been associated with carpentry because we do see this word used of people who make things uh, with wood. It's important to know, though, when we say carpenter, um, we mean a slightly different thing. It probably means somebody who, like, puts houses together or builds plows or things like that. I personally think that what it refers to, if we see in the beginning of Mark, Jesus is uh, placed as having a house in Capernaum. And Capernaum is very known in the ancient world for the manufacture of donkey-driven millstones, which are carved out of rock. And you could call somebody who carves rocks a tectone. So I think that there's a connection there. But Well, when we do have to stop and tell the famous uh, funny story about Golda Meir, who was uh, a, a prime minister of Israel. Uh, and the story goes that she visited the uh, Vatican uh, and talked to Pope Paul VI and said, who would ever thought that uh, the daughter of a carpenter uh, would ever be here? And the Pope is said to have responded, I assure you, we hold carpenters in very high esteem around here. <laughs> That's great. That's a great story. So uh, the sending out of the 12, just to note uh, um, that they, uh, that, that Jesus uh, sends out the 12 to do what he's been doing, right? Mm -hmm. To uh, give them authority over the unclean spirits, um, tells them to, uh, uh, to, to not take um, anything more than a staff uh, um, uh, and sandals uh, and not to take more than one tunic, uh, to come into a, pl when they come into a place uh, to bless it and if a place won't welcome you, you know, uh, shake off the dust uh, against them. Uh, so they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. So we see this, of course, in uh, the other Gospels. We see it in Acts, that this power of Jesus for healing and for life uh, is given also to Jesus' followers uh, to uh, to do what Jesus does. Um, and and so uh, the, the healing power, this force of life, this saving uh, grace uh, and the call to repentance uh, continues to be the work of the church 